Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum Nabi Kareem Muhammad wa alayhi tayyibin wa sahbi salihin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to everyone uh, who is in attendance here. Um, we're going to be going through some uh, interesting stuff. Hopefully it should make some sense uh, to of a lot of the things that you're observing in the world and, and also have some application to your kind of your area of, of that world and your experience of the history uh, behind uh, colonialism, which obviously still has its effects today. And that's obviously led to the division of the Muslim world as it is today. So I will begin by sharing my screen. We can uh, go into it. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so once we just talk about colonialism and the Muslim world, the thing is, many people have issues with colonialism. Uh, liberals uh, have issues with colonialism uh, today. Uh, socialists have issues with, with colonialism, and uh, historically they always have. And many people today in the Muslim world, um, as well as other countries around the world uh, who are not Muslim, um, have issues with colonialism, but they have issues with colonialism despite being the products, the children of colonialism, fulfilling the colonial idea in themselves. It's almost like they like the ideas, they just hate the way it was given to them, but they would have, they would have wanted it anyway. And in a way that's fulfilling the purpose of colonialism in, in its, in its um, origin was to basically spread the ideology of liberalism or, or uh, secular liberalism globally uh, to people who obviously weren't going to convert to it, weren't going to accept it voluntarily. And so they imposed a system on people and forced everybody uh, to live under this, under a new system of, of governance. Now, this is historically very different from the Islamic approach, which is, as you might be aware from even your regional history, um, Islam never imposed Islamic law on non-Muslims because non-Muslims don't believe in Islamic law. So what benefit is Islamic law going to give to them if they don't believe in Islam? Right? It's not going really, to really benefit the hereafter, right? is it? But it was understood that when Muslims are at least guaranteeing the peace and security of the land, uh, then non-Muslims at least can have access to Islam so they can hear the message, they can see the message, and they can see it enacted in, in justice and good works by Muslims, but they were allowed to retain their own communal uh, practices. So whatever practice they want to do in part of their society, even if as Muslims we disagree with it, uh, Muslims generally didn't intervene or interfere in local practices, which is why, uh, now you might think this is obviously perhaps a, a, a bad example, but it's an example nonetheless, so there was a practice, as you might be aware, of wife burning um, on widow burning, so sati, that was practiced in many parts of the Indian subcontinent. And that was still being practiced by non-Muslims in the Indian subcontinent until the British arrival. So clearly the Muslims, although we would view that to be murder, and of course the British viewed it to be murder too, but because it was argued that this was the practice of people following their local deen, their local way of life, that Muslims weren't allowed to, Muslims viewed ourselves that, look, we should give da'wah, we should invite them to Islam, we should advocate that what they're doing is wrong and that it's not a civilized way to be from the Islamic perspective, from the perspective of the creator of the universe, it is wrong. But if they don't accept that, we can't force them to change their internal customs. Now, uh, there, there was some dis discussion amongst Muslim scholars about this matter, but many people cited the fact that it was a, uh, the Zoroastrians, some of them practiced a, a tradition, shall we say, or a culture, cultural practice called self-marriage. It was called self-marriage. Uh, but what it meant is you could marry, if you were a Zoroastrian, you could marry a member of your own family who was not your cousin, so your sister, brother, mother, father, it was actually an incestual marriage. 
which again, as Muslims, we obviously strongly disagree with. Um, but yet again, when the Muslim caliphate obviously expanded its, its control, and of course, Muslims controlled parts of uh, Zoroastrians living in uh, Arabia in terms of the land that they were living on, they guaranteed the security. Uh, it was argued that because the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, never outlawed Zoroastrians from practicing that, that the Muslim caliphates have to honor that and not get involved or intervene with Zoroastrian practice of self-marriage, even though we think it's ancestral, we think it's obviously, uh, we, we strongly disagree with it and we find it obviously um, to be egregiously offensive. So that was the Islamic approach. It was invite to Islam, spread the message, uh, guarantee the security of the land, which was the point of uh, the expansion of, of, it, of Islamic lands was to guarantee security for, for Muslims and non-Muslims, allow non-Muslims to hear about Islam, but you can't force non-Muslims to be, to be Muslim. Uh, you can't impose Islamic law on non-Muslims. So Christians were still drinking wine, still eating pork and having pig farms, despite the fact that, uh, that you're, they were living in Islamic uh, controlled lands. Uh, they were not interfered with, not intervened in their society. This is different from European colonialism. European colonialism doesn't go on the basis of revelation. It doesn't go on the basis of people must voluntarily accept the message because this is the purpose of life of mankind is to voluntarily accept the truth. European colonialism doesn't care about that. European colonial, colonialism based on materialistic political philosophies only considers that there's only one life, this dunya, and justice therefore must be done within this life. And if justice is defined according to their dean, their particular dean, in this case was classical liberalism, then every human being has a right to be, to be given justice. And therefore, if justice is classical liberalism, then every human being must be living under classical liberalism, right? Or, or at least building up to it, right? It's an obligation that all humans must live under that ideology. Likewise, the Marxists or the Marxist socialists they argued the same for their ideology. They said that since uh, socialism uh, or Marxist socialism is, is nothing other than uh, really fulfilling human nature and removing the alienation of the workers from their own human selves and the, the right to enjoy the fruits of their labor and not have their surplus benefit, uh, surplus work uh, exploited by the capitalist bourgeoisie, um, that all workers across the world have a right to live under Marxist socialism, uh, again, like the, like the liberals, whether they want to or not, right? Whether they want to or not is not the question. The question is, if they're human, and we believe this is justice, and we believe all humans deserve justice, therefore all humans must have the justice that we believe in, whether they like it or not. And that was really the argument presented by these materialistic philosophies, whereas Obviously, for us, from Islam, we believe there's no compulsion in way of life. A deen in Arabic is a comprehensive term. Obviously, it means what you believe, how, what you, how you live. Uh, in the ancient world, there was no separation of religion and law and state because that was a ridiculous idea. It's still a ridiculous idea. It's just you think about it. You have a purpose in life. Humans have a purpose of life defined by God or gods, depending on your religion. So they, the God, God or gods, depending on which religion you follow, define morality, define good and bad. Okay? Although generally polytheists believe in a head God, they always believed in a head God um, from their ancestors, but then they corrupted it by adding further gods later on, but that's a different discussion. So because morality is defined, good and bad is defined by the, the divine, where does law come from? Well, law is based on morality, right? Law is based on morality. And morality is defined by the divine. So the law system is naturally connected to what is divine because what is defined defines human purpose, the purpose of human life. So how can life's affairs be separate from the human purpose of life? It, it's irrational, it doesn't make sense at all whatsoever. So in the ancient world, every civilization, every single one, had no separation between these, these uh, what they believed about human purpose, God or, or and the sub-deities or gods of their polytheists. Uh, 
um, and their law system and their culture. In fact, the word culture, religion, uh, well, culture, religion, ideology, if you like, worldview, in English, these are all English words, of course, they all really mean exactly the same thing. Um, there is no such thing as you have a separate culture and you have a separate religion. Um, you follow something. In the ancient world, they would only ask you, what do you follow? Um, even Aristotle, who coined the term politics, where we get the word politics from, the word politeia in Greek means the what the, the people of a city, what way of life they are following, which includes what gods they worship. This was how Aristotle understood it. So the origin of politics, the actual Greek word now is used now across the world after colonialism, of course, um, spreading European languages and European um, philosophy. Um, the word politeia includes in its origin belief in, in God or gods and uh, their effect on mor morality. So Aristotle would ask, uh, would, would, if he was to encounter Medina, if he ever went to Medina, let's say, maybe he never did, of course, but let's say if he could go in, if he went in the future, from his perspective and went to Medina, uh, he would say Islam is the politeia of Medina because it's, it's their way of life, it's what they follow of this, of this city state. And um, that's basically the, how the ancient world understood it, even in the Indus Valley, uh, civil, well, maybe not the Indus Valley civilization, but because they spoke a language which is not Sanskrit. But uh, in Sanskrit, the word Dharma is used. That's been obviously more local uh, to, to you guys, of course. And Dharma is a, it's a comprehensive term. It, it, it doesn't mean, it means law, it means way of life. It's in essence a very good approximation of the Arabic word, Deen. So now you understand that, uh, it's important that you do understand it, then you have to understand what the Europeans did when they engaged in colonialism. And that is that in order to change how you live, uh, they, they can't appear to be contradicting your beliefs about God, gods, what have you, right? They, because they know that then people would, would give resistance. And at the same time, it was difficult for them to force conversion to Christianity um, at that and in the 19th century, because many of them were materialists, uh, some of them deists, but many of them were secular liberals. And the process that happened in Europe was in order for them to, it, the, the birth of this ideology was basically about separating religion or rather separating what comes from revelation from how you organize human society. Because they had ikhtilaf, they had difference of opinion amongst themselves about how to, um, about interpretation of the Bible. Uh, as, it was actually between Protestants, it's not but the Catholics and Protestants, it was actually between Protestants. They didn't know, once they got rid of the Catholic church, every Protestant became their own church in a way. It was, it was very confusing. And because Christianity doesn't also, uh, it, it has a certain quirky history in that because it assimilated into Roman civilization, it got rid of its political laws from the time of Moses. So it got rid of those laws to assimilate into Roman civilization. And so Christianity has always been a bit of a quirky religion like that um, because uh, Jewish law is political. It's, and it's normal to be so. The word to, you know, Torah, to, to, Torah um, means law. <laughs> the, the word actually means the, the law. So this is basically, uh, secularism is, is, a brand, is a Western idea and it's brand new, uh, but it's, it's not a separation of what you believe from how you conduct politics. No, no, no. It's a separation of only religion or rather revelation. So what is, comes from God, God or gods are kept separate and societies to be reformed on a new aqida, a new creed, which comes from the idea of the supremacy of the individual. The individual is sovereign over themselves and their property, although there's ikhtilaf amongst Western philosophers as to uh, or, or how to interpret that. And that's why there's so many different madhahib in the West, uh, schools of thought on uh, the enlightenment philosophies of individualism, which is the individualism is the aqidah of, of the West, which is the idea that humans are absolutely sovereign. There's nothing higher than the human being and they're all, all humans are equal. Uh, you might say, well, where's the ikhtilaf in this? Well, of course, the difference of opinion occurs when um, how, how sovereign is the human being versus the state? Uh, if we're all equal, does that mean that we're all equal in getting resources as well? Because people have different wealth you know, and people are born into different situations, different wealth. Uh, 
how, if we only have one life, how is that fair that everyone has different wealth, right? Can't we all, because people are born into a rich family. They didn't work for that wealth. Why should they get more money than maybe a person who's poor, but has really good intellect and could do so much good if only they were invested in, but they don't have that opportunity. And so they don't get rich. How is that fair? This is a socialist argument. So there's ikhtilaf amongst the West as to how to resolve these problems, which they, they can't resolve them. Um, but anyway, that's a different discussion, of course. But we're going to get into kind of colonialism in the Muslim world. And we're going to discuss really, in essence, uh, the liberal version of expansion, um, their, their version of jihad and expansion. Uh, but their expansion is not one where it's about just guaranteeing world security and giving people the choice, presenting them with Islam, but they can re reject it and we don't change their, their law system. We don't intervene in their cultural practices. Nope, it's the other way around for them. It's they're going to recreate the entire world in their own image, that everyone will follow their deen and revelation. Yeah, you can believe whatever revelation you want. You can believe in any God you want as long as that God is silent or you silence him when talking about how humans should live, right? And then reestablishing human society on a different basis, uh, which is a basis of uh, individualism and uh, equality of all individuals, which, which might sound very nice to many people think, well, you know, what's wrong with that? But there are many problems that arise with this because humans, although you can separate humans into individuals, but they affect each other more than just fighting each other, right? They can affect each other much more than just fighting. And this is where the oppression begins. Uh, and this is where problems occur, psychological problems, depression, uh, people feeling frustrated. Uh, in the West, with the, it, one of the countries where you'd, you'd see uh, the most, let's say, open uh, laws concerning allowing people to be promiscuous, sexually promiscuous, you see high rates of sexual frustration. Why is that? Like, you don't even need to get married in the West to have sex. Why high rates of se sexual frustration? Why uh, some of the highest rates of depression in the world and the, the need to take antidepressants? Why is that? Is it meant to be freedom and enjoyment and fun and all this stuff? Well, turns out humans aren't as simple as the Enlightenment philosophers in the West. They call themselves the Enlightenment philosophers um, first thought. Um, but also, I'd also like to kind of, before we start the, the main presentation, because I'm going to have some slides to show you, I'd also like to say that uh, many people are fooled by Western uh, political ideologies or philosophies, uh, like secular liberalism or, and even socialism, uh, because they think that the West is technologically superior, militarily superior, economically superior, because it implemented these ideologies. Right, because it implemented these political systems. But the truth is, and if anyone really just knows um, history, is that's really not the case. The West started to technologically advance from uh, the Dark Ages, its Dark Ages, which is just basically the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. So when the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire, not the Eastern one, the Western side collapsed, all these barbarians, you know, Germanic barbarians came in, uh, what you're gonna have, you're gonna have dark ages. You have all these barbarians, they can't repair Roman technology. They're not educated in Roman uh, engineering and sciences and things like this. So what you're gonna have, you're gonna have a dark ages, of course, you're gonna have anarchy and chaos. And uh, this had nothing to do with Christianity, by the way, because the Roman empire was Christian prior to its collapse and the Eastern Roman empire didn't have a dark ages and they were Christian, the, the state religion, the state religion was Christianity. The, the emperor controlled the, po the uh, bishops, uh, the, the, the bishops, the council bishops. Now they're the Orthodox church, they're known as the Orthodox church, not the Catholic church. Um, and, and yet they were still technologically developed, economically quite successful, very powerful. So it had nothing to do with re religion, had no effect on technology. Uh, at least it had no detrimental effect. But what happened when is that of course, when Europe launches crusades when they obviously attack Muslims in Andalusia, uh, Andalusia obviously, or uh, Al Andalus rather, but say, um, some people call it Andalusia, but anyway, let's call it Al Andalus in Arabic. Um, what we see is that they encounter lots of Muslim uh, sciences. Um, like someone has their uh, 
Okay, Khen Shala. Um, sounds like someone's being childishly uh, disruptive. <laughs> anyway, so uh, what happened in the West is they encountered Muslim learning, science, technology, and they started to translate it, started to read it, started to educate themselves. And from the 12th century onwards, they basically started to technologically advance from the 12th century, so it's 1100s. And so by the time the West reaches the time of the enlightenment, so there was already a, re a renaissance happening in its technology. It was, you can see that their clothes were changing, their new inventions were being made, Galileo, all these things were happening. Uh, and there was no liberal government. There was no secular government at all in Europe. So 500 years to 600 years of technological progression until the steam engine gets invented. And there's no liberalism, no secularism in the West. It's only now at the turn of the uh, 18th century to the 19th century, you start to see uh, kind of secular liberal regimes pop up in the West. So there's no connection between it. But of course, now when the West is going to colonize the world after becoming secular liberal, uh, they uh, obviously in the past, they, have, they did try to force people to become Christian like in South America, in the Philippines, they forced people to become, that, that was their colonialism, where they actually forced people to become Christian. Um, but not, not all European powers did so because it, uh, it was, uh, they, they felt that there was no need or they could just push the natives away, not a problem. But after they stopped in, you know, uh, having Christianity as their main, let's say, worldview, and they adopted kind of secular worldviews, then it was that was the dean they were going to push. That was the way of life they were going to push on people around the world. So the West already started to become technologically more advanced than Muslims uh, around the 1700s. And by that time, uh, that was only then, uh, so they were al already advanced. And only then did you see secular uh, liberal regimes uh, be created in, in, in the Western world. And when many people talk about oh, I mean, the West is more advanced because it has a uh, liberal understanding of women's rights, it calls it women's rights, but it means the liberal understanding of women, of rights for women, um, which is different from the socialist understanding, of course, uh, uh, or for LGBTQ, so basically same sex intercourse, these rights. All these rights only came about in the last century. And later, later in the last century, right, for, for the most of, well, Europe and Britain was doing its colonialism, it was, again, it wasn't giving women the right to vote. Women, uh, if they were married, they couldn't own property. Their husband owns their property. So in Islam, we don't even have, we don't have that. But in the 19th century, women couldn't own property if they were married. Their property goes to their husband. This is the same 19th century British society which colonialized uh, your region of the world and many regions around the world. Uh, of course, uh, what Britain and many of these countries uh, and Spain learned about colonialism, they learned from their own, own territory. So arguably England co you know, colonized uh, Ireland right, and Scotland and they, they learned those kind of th those procedures, you could say, methods. And, and the Spanish uh, co co well, colonialized the south of Spain from the Muslims and they kicked out the Muslims. So they learned how to build colonies and to gradually um, push out natives and things like that. So they learned all that stuff. And then they took that to the world because they had already been doing it in, in Europe. They were successful and then they, they made it global. So anyway, that's a bit of context for you just to understand what we're kind of uh, dealing with. Now, I, I have other lectures where I deal with secular liberalism and why it's incorrect, but let's just go into um, the actual discussion uh, today on the matter of uh, liberalism uh, on the colonialism as a result of liberalism. So uh, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, kind of giving us a warning so the people, so the people of around, there'll be people of, of places around the world will soon summon one another to attack you as people when eating invite others to share their dish. Someone asked, will that be because of our small numbers at that time? He replied, no, you will be numerous at that time 
but you'll be scum and rubbish like that carried down by a torrent. You know, like the froth, uh, the froth, scum is actually a word in English to me in the froth uh, on, on water, basically, when it's like crashing or whatever, there's a little foam that forms. So that's, that, technically, that's called scum. <laughs> so the scum rubbish that's carried down by a torrent, so a torrent of water, and Allah will take fear of you from the breast of your enemy and put wahan uh, into your innovation, which is basically, you could say, a type of laziness, um, a, a type of, into your hearts. And people asked, what is wahan? And the, the Prophet Muhammad said love of the world and dislike of death so it is basically uh, your 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 interest are rooted in the dunya and no longer in principles no longer in principles for that obviously go on into the hereafter and that's because we've been so focused about our comfort in this life uh, and not being standing up for principles uh, that we're going to be subjugated by peoples around the world because we just want a comfortable life. We don't want to actually stand up for principles. So he warned us and we'll, have, we'll be large in number and that won't matter because the, the people we face, uh, they will not be scared of us at all. And lo and behold, that's exactly what's happening today in the, in the Muslim world. So um, first and foremost, most people don't realize that liberalism has a justification for colonialism. Colonialism wasn't, wasn't something done by liberals, which was a bit naughty, but their ideology doesn't really ask them to do it. No, liberals, liberals get violent. Liberals believe in violence. They can, they can be violent. They're, they're more than happy to be violent when it's necessary. For them, evil is just being violent unnecessarily. But when it's necessary uh, and necessary being judged by what they think is necessary. So it's whatever they need to get their goal, whatever they need to be successful, that's what they call necessary. Uh, then they'll be violent and they'll justify it. So uh, John Stuart Mill, obviously, he's a classical lib uh, liberal philosopher. He said, responding to the criticisms of how, obviously, the Europeans colonize other countries and obviously torture and kill the natives and do many bad things to, to natives around the world, he said, the criticisms, therefore, which are so often made upon the conduct of the French in Algeria or of the English in India, proceed, it would seem, mostly on a wrong principle. A civilized government cannot help having barbarous neighbors. When it has, it cannot always content itself with a defensive position, one of mere resistance to aggression. After a longer or shorter interval of forbearance, it either finds itself obliged to conquer them or to assert so much authority over them and so break their spirit that they gradually sink into a state of dependence upon itself. But among civilized peoples, members of an equal community of nations like Christian Europe, the question assumes another aspect and must be decided on totally different principles. It would be an affront to the reader to discuss the immor immorality of wars of conquest or of conquest even as the consequence of lawful war, the annexation of any civilized people to the dominion of another unless by their own spontaneous election. So, um, what he's arguing is that basically the civilized nations, it's only a matter of time before they conquer the barbarian nations, which he would call people, in essence, people who are not following um, the kind of liberalism that societies that, that his society is following. Now, at that time, the West never called themselves the West. That was a term that the Russians would come up with later and would become popular because the Russians called, the, called those to the west of them the West, because they had issues with them, and obviously you know, we, we, we know these kind of things. Um, but at that time, they called themselves Christian Europe. That was their term for themselves. Was, we are Christian Europe, and these other people are barbarians. So he said, it's only a matter of time before they get conquered because uh, of, of how they are in their society and uh, we have to assert authority over them. It's only a matter of time to control them, to civilize them, basically, because uh, they are they are barbarous neighbors, and you, you can't just live with barbarous neighbors forever. Uh, you have to do something about them. Now, in this discussion, he talks about, uh, I suppose you could say, what you can and can't do to a barbarous nation. So he says that um, how you treat your fellow Christian Europeans 
it is not the same basis by which you should treat these barbarous nations, nations which are not liberal. So his argument is to suppose that the same international customs and the same rules of international morality can obtain between one civilization and another and between civilizations and barbarians is a grave error and one which no statesman can fall into. So basically you can't treat barbarous nations as you treat uh, your fellow quote unquote civilized nation of which they named um, India at the time as one of those things and Algeria, which is uh, obviously North Africa. Um, he said that basically barbarians don't reciprocate the same rules, so you don't have to follow the same rules with them. And he says that to characterize any conduct whatever towards a barbarous nation as a violation of the law of nations only shows that he who speaks has never considered the subject. A violation of great principles of morality may easily be, but barbarians have no rights as a nation, except a right to such treatment as may at the earliest possible period uh, make them fit for becoming one. The only moral laws for the relation between a civilized and a barbarous government are the universal rules of morality between man and man. So basically, there's no special rules of morality. Uh, there's just the basic, in a way, laws of nature that govern a civilized nation's conduct to a uncivilized one. But he said that you can, you can violate the principles of morality against a barbarous nation because they don't have any rights as a nation. So they don't have a right to be um, independent or what have you until they have civilized themselves via your tutelage to becoming a civilized nation. So this is how they justified the occupation and coercion of uh, so-called barbarous nations, according to them, uh, which is just anyone who basically isn't uh, isn't liberal, uh, wasn't following their version of liberalism um, at the time. But you still see that the arguments by uh, many interventionists in the West today, when they talk about uh, upsetting and uprooting other governments around the world, like Saddam Hussein, uh, they, they tried to say it was about weapons of mass destruction, but the main argument was, well, it doesn't matter about weapons of mass destruction. What matters is that Saddam Hussein was a, a tyrant, a despot. He wasn't obviously liberal. He was secular. He was secular, though, <laughs> but he wasn't liberal. And therefore, uh, we, we write to upseat him if we want to. Right? We write to upseat him, uh, which is why in the Muslim world today, anyway, uh, why many such governments who are dictators, um, why... If they are a dictator, they know that they basically have to be on the West's good side uh, because the West could just cite that as an excuse for intervention. But of course, the West doesn't actually want to change the political system to straight up liberalism uh, at the very be from, the, from, the, from the beginning, because as you'll see, they believe that not every country uh, should get liberalism at the very beginning. It needs to be digested by a secular system first, and then you can have liberalism on top. So secularism is like the first layer, the first, uh, when you're painting a wall, it's the first coat. And then the second coat uh, is liberalism. So secularism is basically, let's get rid of the religion of that society first. Let's make it uh, out of the way, not involved in politics. So that's secularism. And then the second coat is, now when they're ready, we can give them rights and freedoms so they can enjoy things not based on uh, their religion because now they've probably given up their religion now. So we don't have to worry that if we give them freedoms to have elections and elect whoever they want, that they will elect an Islamic party, which will bring back the Islamic system that they tried so hard to get rid of. And we'll look into where they got that idea, uh, how they justify this and how they say it quite explicitly. Um, as John Stuart Mill said, again, in his, in his ironically titled On Liberty, he said, it is perhaps hardly necessary to say that this doctrine is meant to apply only to human beings in the maturity of their faculties. So he's talking about giving people rights and freedoms, but he says only human beings who are in maturity of their faculties. Uh, he's not talking about being a ch children. He's talking about societies which are not mature. It, and this is based on an idea in the West that the West, uh, that every, all humanity was going in, uh, in one direction, right? The liberal direction, it was inevitable. It's the same argument that socialists say about themselves. They say that all society is eventually gonna become socialist and then uh, become a, a communist utopia. They're slowly progressing. Well, the liberals had their own version of this um, progression of humanity into a liberal utopia, not a not socialist utopia. And uh, they, 
but to explain societies that weren't liberal like they were at that time they weren't following classical liberalism um they had to say well not all societies and in it, and sometimes they use the word races not all races they'd say are as mature as our race that's how they would argue it and, and hence that's why racism is often uh, argued at this time amongst many liberals uh as a way to explain why other, other societies uh, haven't yet met the level of progression uh, not just technological progression but ideological progression meaning uh, these societies haven't discovered liberalism yet for themselves but that's because they're still young right but give them enough time or if we don't uh, let's just hurry up by we go there and we force uh, teach them liberalism and then they will become eventually mature enough and when they are mature uh, we can then take away the tyrant out of them and we can uh, in, allow them to live under uh, full-blown liberalism but see how he explains this um so yeah it's only meant to apply to humans in their maturity their faculties uh, we may leave out of consideration those backward states of society in which the race itself may be considered um, as in its nonage nonage is basically meaning like you're, you're a child basically you're in, you're in time of being of a child uh, despotism despotism so absolute government tyranny is a legitimate mode of government in dealing with barbarians provided the end be their improvement and the means justified by actually affecting the end right the the end justifies the means you've heard that kind of argument before well this john stuart mill isn't is someone who was heavily influential in british government uh, many laws in England were a res result of him and his changes in England. Of course, he had colonial interests as well. And these are the arguments and justifications that were typical of his time to say that that tyranny is useful for barbarian people to help shape them. And eventually they'll get to if they become mature enough, then they can have the liberties and rights that we have. But they're not they're not yet mature. So they need a tyrannical government. Uh, and I'll continue. Liberty as a principle has no application to any state of things anterior to the time when mankind have become capable of being improved by free and equal discussion. Until then, there is nothing for them but implicit or obedience. But as soon as mankind have attained the capacity of being guided to their own improvement by conviction or persuasion, i.e. embracing secular liberalism, um, compulsion, either in, direct, in the direct form or in the of pains and penalties for non-compliance is no longer admissible needed as a means to their own good. So um, if a society gets to the point where they can, they'll just willingly embrace uh, the liberal values and ideas of, in essence, the sovereignty of the individual uh, and the, the political system that Akira is based on, until they accept it willingly, they have to be compelled in direct form with pains and penalties, right? Until it's no longer needed, until they will accept the, the new political system and they, they're happy to live by that political system. But until then, they need tyrants. So in the Muslim world, many governments are tyrannical, are dictators, are despots, and the West doesn't intervene. In fact, the West has very good relations with them because they're still the, they would consider that, that these Muslim countries are still being digested. The Islam is still being broken down a bit because the people are not yet ready for the second phase. And so what, what you'll see is that uh, they, uh, they'll allow NGOs, non-governmental organizations to be, um, they call themselves human rights activists, uh, but that's just uh, a, a, you could say a euphemism for basically being a a a die or a advocator of secular liberalism and they'll be calling the society they'll be giving dawah to the society saying that if you want out of this dictatorship uh you have to in, implement liberalism uh and so and so uh that's the only way out uh, but the dict what do the dictators say in response they, they say the the people that i rule or govern are not ready for rights and liberals liber, uh, and liberal ideas because they haven't yet fully become secular because Islam is still a problem. If you were to give them elections tomorrow, they would vote in Islam. And we saw that happened in Egypt when obviously the uh, Mubarak was 
there was protests against him. The military controllers of, the, of the Egypt, which are the real controllers of Egypt, no longer saw him as useful anymore. They took him out of power. They gave elections and they tried to put a lot of resources to get the secular, one of their secular uh, candidates elected to be the new puppet government, right? So they, they get one election and then only one. Uh, but then something happened, it was surprising, which is the, the party that was advocating for Islam won the election. And then the military had to, had to wonder, how do we, what do we do? How do we control this, this group? And how do we basically get them hated enough to get them kicked out? And so they made, they shut down the, the government, made life a complete anarchy and chaos. Uh, made it look like the government was incompetent because the government, this new government that was elected, don't have power because the military are the ones who have the power and they control all the institutions. Uh, elections are just obviously a, a, a facade, a, a piece of theatre. Uh, and so, and then they they made the, the people angry enough against this government until they, they allowed the protests against the government, although they were counter protests, and then they could arrest the, this, this president put him in jail and then bring a, a new candidate who was a former military commander, they always are in most cases, and then this military commander will re-implement the secular dictatorship as was before. Because as they argued, it, this shows that the people of Egypt are not ready for secular liberalism. So they have to be under secular dictatorship until they, Islam is completely gone from their hearts. Not completely gone, but let's just say they view Islam as only just how you pray. That's it. Um, no concern for it. And then they can be trusted with having um, the, the full system of, of, uh, of liberal government, uh, secular liberalism, basically. Uh, obviously, we also saw that um, the, British, um, the British government didn't just create, um, when they were colonizing, they, they didn't just say, we're gonna take over power and that's it. They had to change the minds of the people. They had to educate them, right? To, um, in essence, make them um, re, uh, 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 look at the world in a different lens. And the only way you can do that, the only way you can do that, so that's meant to be um, uh, India there, um, is you control the education system and you basically create the kind the minds of the people you want to um, to take over but you can't do it all at once you can't edu re educate the whole population it takes too long there's going to be uh, resistance so instead what you do is um, you first train up a class of people who will become the administrators you give them jobs in government you make you teach them how to administer the government according to uh, western political values and uh, you could say administrative techniques and you defund the, step, the traditional education institutions. So if any people were, were studying uh, to be scholars, uh, Islamic scholars who at the time were jurisprudent. So when you, when you graduate in, a, in essence, uh, you become a court judge and you apply your learning into court cases. So you become an act judge. judge. Anyone who studies law is a law student at university. You don't study it to give hypothetical ethical discussions of philosophy. Right. What you do is you study it so that you can apply it in court cases. So all the British did is they didn't have to outlaw that. All they had to do is they had to, uh, the, the taxes that the people were paying for educational institutions, you just stop that money going there, defund them and fund or create new institutions and educate them as you want to educate them. And uh, the infamous Thomas B. Macaulay, of course, who was involved in the colonial, in the colonial activity in India itself, or the Indian subcontinent, uh, he said uh, on his minute on education, uh, we must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern, a class of persons Indian in blood and color, but English in tastes, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. To that class, we may leave it to refine the vernacular dialects of the country, to enrich those dialects with, with terms of science borrowed from the Western nomenclature, and to render them by degrees fit vehicles for conveying knowledge to the mass, uh, the great mass of the population. So what you'll find is that almost all the elites in Muslim countries are, uh, or, or, firstly, their ancestors were educated in, in these institutions in 
in, in, in India and in Egypt and many Muslim countries. But to those that didn't have institutions in their country, they, uh, and certainly right now, they send those children out to Western universities to be educated at Western universities, and then they are sent back. And you'll clearly see that uh, they have a great opinion of obviously Western uh, political philosophy, they implement it, they justify it. Um, and when people often tell them in the West, they say, uh, you're, you know, you're going to be a leader of this, of this country or, or your family is uh, involved in leadership in this country. Um, it's doing all these uh, despotic things. It's arresting people, arbitrarily torturing people, uh, extrajudicial killings, letting gangs on the streets to, to, to which are supporters and leaving, not, the, um, not arresting them and letting me, your supporters fight and, and uh, brutalize your, your political opponents. Uh, why do you do that? How do you justify that? And what do they always say? They say, well, you know, my country is not like England. It's not like America. It's not like France. We have to do things differently there. It's what is needed at the moment. Yeah, and, and hopefully there'll be a time when we can have the same kind of uh, liberal uh, rights and rules that you guys enjoy, but it's not, they're not yet ready. And what they mean by that is because they say the Islamists, quote unquote, uh, i.e. Muslims, um, they are going, they are resisting, uh, and they're still, they still exist, and they are still a political force in our country, so we haven't finished digesting them yet. Well, once, it, it will require a few, a couple of decades, decades, when they are digested fully, and they are completely rendered passive uh, and uh, forgotten about, uh, then we can, we can gradually make these kind of reforms. To bring about the full system, right, the, the full product right right now you only have half the product but they're going to bring about the full product but only when you're ready right uh, only when you're, you're ready they need you to be digested uh, to change your your mindset to fit with uh, their mindset um now how do they approach the muslim world well as you know the muslim world uh, the main, the central areas of it were generally united under the ottoman caliphate it was, it was it, extended to North Africa, all the way to North Africa, obviously into Europe and as, uh, as far as Iran. And Muslims, Muslim regional princes and sultanates uh, generally gave bayah to the Ottoman Caliph because in Islam, there can only be one Imam, the Imam of the, of the, the Jama'at, the Jama'at of the Muslims, the community of the Muslims. And all Muslims owe him bayah, even if he doesn't directly control your area of the world. Um, now, what was what, what the Europeans did, and they stated this as an argument, is that they were worried, they didn't like, obviously, the unity of the Muslims uh, in order to digest the Muslim world to begin military uh, uh, and full-on colonialism. They had to militarily invade and then break up the Muslim world into artificial countries, which is where we have now uh, nationalism comes about. Now, as you can see, wh wh why, why artificial? Right. Why do I say nationalism is artificial? You see, many of you are born into a world where, you know, the country you live in and, and the word, the wording of this country and, and it's called a country is just natural because it's all you've ever known. Right. It's just natural. Like, yeah, you know, there is Bangladesh, there is Pakistan, there is Egypt, there is Algeria, there is Turkey, Syria, all these different countries. But many of your grandparents remember the time when these countries didn't exist they just popped into existence and of course your great 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 grandparents uh, certainly don't remember anything like those countries or even the idea of those uh, those countries these countries are artificial creations and they're created deliberately to divide the world into different pieces manageable pieces because when the west realized it was too expensive to maintain military occupation uh, it had to leave it was you know take their soldiers and bring them elsewhere. But they didn't want to stop benefiting from the land that they have spent so much resources developing and creating a new elite that thinks just like them. So they maintained good relations with this elite because the elite still depends on their, on their colonial, uh, colonial you know, masters, uh, but for, for help after, how do I manage this country now? You're giving me a country to manage. Uh, I managed only part of it in a way before as, a, as an administrator. Now you're giving it to me to manage. Um, uh, what do I do about you know foreign currency and trade and all this stuff? I, I never controlled that before. Uh, they always had a relationship 
with their former colonial masters. And of course, the British Commonwealth is, in essence, what we call you know, a type of post-colonial entity. It's, a, it's after colonialism maintaining this relationship for beneficial, for Britain's benefit, really. Um, but for mutual trade, they'd say, uh, so that Britain can benefit from its, its former colonies. It was only when, when World War II crippled Britain and America rose to power that America or United States of America really took over influence of the, the countries that were formerly uh, on, under the influence of Britain. And so then Britain started to decline because United States of America just had more power after World War II. It, it emerged as a superpower after World War II. And so it can make a much better deal and it has much more power to control these countries and not just most countries in the Muslim world, but also in South America and in Southeast Asia. So they've been doing it to a lot of different countries. Um, but, there, but unlike these other countries, Islam was particularly difficult or an obstacle for them because it was a comprehensive deen, which was a rival to secular liberalism. And secular liberalism just can't, couldn't refute it. It couldn't answer, have no answer to it. Of course, uh, they used to argue that the only way to colonize Muslims is to make them Christian first, because Christianity allows the possibility of, of a transition to secularism and a justification of secularism, and then eventually liberalism of some, some kind, it's easier. It's easier to make that transition. Whereas Islam is just, it's our leader is just resistant because it, it has its own basis. It, it makes sense. It's rational. Uh, it was hard to refute, hard to deal with. So they had to use more military force on Muslim um, countries uh, or Muslim areas. Now, one example of really the artificiality of these Muslim nation states that they created um, after they, were, they left uh, is example here. Um, the Iraqis and Syrians and people from Palestine, uh, as well as what would later on be Lebanon and people from Arabia and people from Egypt all speak the same language. They all speak the same language. They speak Arabic, it's the same language. Yeah, there's different accents and dialects, but they speak the same language. Why then make borders between them? They, they follow the, they majority follow all the same religion as a majority in all the same countries. Why make these borders? Well, you can't have a united Muslim world, can you? You have to make divisions. And just to show you how ridiculous these nation states, which are today, which many Iraqis and Syrians will be proud of, they'll be flying their flag, proud of these states, which they never chose, and of course was chosen for them, uh, is illustrated with your notice that France was going to create a, a French influence state, which is basically uh, Syria here, and it encompasses Mosul. But as you know, Mosul is actually part of Iraq today. So, so what happened? Well, they discovered oil. The British discovered oil here in Mosul and, and to the west of Mosul. And they didn't like that the fact that you know France is going to get an area of land that's going to have oil in it that they can control. So basically, England bullied France to concede this part to the new um, kind of new territory of, of Iraq that was under British influence. And because of oil, because there was oil discovered in that area, the Iraqi people from this part of the world here will get to call themselves Iraqi. If there was no oil, they'd be Syrian. And purely because oh, Britain wanted some oil, People who would otherwise be Syrian are now Iraqi. And that's kind of how ridiculous the whole nation state idea or concept is. And of course, um, Lebanon was created, um, Lebanon was created as a, uh, as, as a way to control Muslims by diluting the uh, kind of the population proportions. So Christians lived in, in a, around the area of Mount Lebanon. It was, a, it was like a majority Christian enclave, you could say. Uh, and Muslims lived obviously in the valleys. So what they did is they basically made a division. Um, they made a division here. And they said that this land will be a new, a separate country, uh, even though in Arabic, all this is called Al-Sham. This whole area is just called Al-Sham, right? The Levant, okay? But they said, no, we'll make a separate country here so that in that country, Christians have a bigger ma majority and they can control the political system and keep the Muslims in check because now the Muslims can't ask for an Islamic political system when one third of the population is Christian. I mean, not that, uh, it wasn't an issue that we had before because as Islam understood it, an Islamic political system would have Islamic law for Muslims, but wouldn't have Islamic law for non-Muslims. So that was never an issue, but 
under the nation state concept, where the state represents a nation um, and everyone is now a equal, an equal nation member of, of a new identity, and the government has to now reflect everybody. There can only be one law, not multiple laws, and the government has to reflect everyone's um, input, quote unquote, although in reality, that doesn't really happen. Um, it allowed Lebanon not to be an Islamic country. It was easy to control the Muslims uh, there by dilute, by changing, by it's called gerrymandering, where you just draw borders to control the demographics of, of uh, and proportions of areas. And um, likewise, uh, now initially Turkey was, was going to be given a large area to Armenians who obviously are non-Muslim, but the Turkish nationalists uh, obviously reacted to that and they reacted to, to obviously control by Greece, uh, controlled by France, and they, they fought it although the British actually made an agreement, I think, with these Turkish nationalists and let and literally just retreated and let the Turkish nationalists um, have power because Turkey, because um, England doesn't mind Turkish nationalists, but England has a problem with Turkish Muslim, uh, who, Muslims who want Islam. Now that's a problem that England doesn't, doesn't like, but uh, in its policy, but nationalists, Turkish nationalists, that's fine. If your basis is not Islam, they'd have no problem with that. So this is an example of, in essence, the artificiality, and yeah, and of course, uh, Kuwait was really just cut into this into this piece just around Kuwait City, uh, where there's a large concentration of oil wealth, and because and it's no no kind of coincidence that these small Arab countries that have lots of oil wealth and small population, when you could argue that why doesn't Kuwait benefit the oil wealth benefit the Iraqis, is because Kuwait can be easier easy easily controlled when it's small, and the British can now control it because Iraq and, and Kuwait are separate countries and the Iraqis won't come to help the Kuwaitis and the Kuwaitis won't help the Iraqis because they're separate countries. Even though they speak the same language, they have the same religion, they're both ethnically Arab, um, which is, uh, comes as many things, but generally by this point in the history, they just see each other as Arab. So it's really artificial. Um, the idea of nationalism is, a, again, a European invention, um, and it never existed in history. It, it was really a recent European inter uh, intervention, uh, invention. And this particular one, um, it was actually the French Revolution was a major spreader of it, but you see this philosopher called Johann Gottfried Herders, a German philosopher, who first defines that a nation, a Volk, is, is really the basis for political uh, units. And he defines nations as being determined by primarily by language. He thought that that's a good way to divide humanity up yeah. into language groups. And then maybe you can have a state that represents this language group as the best way to, to reorganize society. And so nationalism started to rise in Europe when prior to that, it was about kingdoms. You know, the kingdom can be can have a kingdom of many different ethnic groups many different languages. That was the, the historical norm, normal. That was it. Uh, you had the ancient Greeks had many different city-states. Each state was separate. They didn't help each other because they all spoke the same language. And in fact, when the Persians invaded, many Greeks helped the Persians against other Greek states that, that they hated, right? So the idea of nationalism just didn't occur in the ancient world. Why should I be united with other people just because they speak the same, the same as me? Like, so what? Right. I mean, United States of America, they speak English, Canadians speak English, Britain speaks English, for the most part, there's a few Welsh people, obviously well, their, their, major, their mother tongue is Welsh. Um, Australians speak English, but then, and South African, you know, the main language is in, uh, the national language is English. Uh, you don't see them now saying, well, we have to be one country now. No, right? Likewise, in Belgium, Belgium, they have Dutch speakers and they have French speakers. So there's two different languages in Belgium and there's tension between them, of course, because of nationalism, uh, but they don't want to rejoin, the French people speakers don't want to rejoin uh, or join France and the Dutch speakers don't want to join Holland, uh, but they, there's an argument that some might want to just be separate countries even within themselves in, in this small enclave. Um, likewise, as you guys know very well, uh, you're, you have Bengali neighbors, uh, which are Bengali speakers like yourselves, uh, they are in India, and they're not, they're majority Hindu, of course, uh, but then again, you have, I think, about maybe 10% or maybe 8 to eight, 9% eight, Hindus in Bangladesh. Uh, do correct me if I'm, in, I'm wrong about that. Um, so why, why the partition right, between Bengali speakers in India and Bengali speakers in Bangladesh? 
when there are Muslim Bengalis in the, the, the Bengal area or West Bengal, and there are Bengal, and obviously there are Bengali speakers in, in Bangladesh. So um, nationalism, even though it was defined as, uh, as a defined by a language group, it's really just arbitrary. But the idea was that the state represents the people. And so the nationalism was about the state representing the people. And this might sound like a very obvious idea, it represents the people, but the argument developed which people, whose people, what people are represented by the government. Um, and you know this because there's in many countries where different ethnic groups reside or different language speakers reside because of nationalism now, uh, there is disputes as to who the government works for. And they always say, well, the government seems to sort of serve the majority community. So in India, even though there are multiple ethnic groups, multiple languages spoken, uh, they call themselves one country under the new name, Indian. We are just Indians, right? Okay, well, that's in, in English anyway, okay? Uh, they might call themselves Hindustani or um, from uh, uh, Bharat or whatever term they want, they like to use. Um, uh, of course, some want to now establish a Hindu Rashtra, right? Because they say that Hinduism is the defining uh, culture of the people, or the indigenous religion or the indigenous culture of the people. And so the state must represent the people. And that's because Hinduism is indigenous. It's not actually for them for, the, for in its origins. That's an interesting historical subject, by the way. But because they say that, they say that the state must represent Hindu values now because the state represents the people. Which people? Uh, it's going to be one of the peoples. It's going to be the majority people. Um, likewise, one of the reasons that there was a war between Bangladesh and West Pakistan, right, when it was used to be called West Pakistan, East Pakistan, was because it was perceived that the West Pakistanis were, were giving priority to West Pakistan and not to East Pakistan. And so people, Bengalis in East Pakistan, they'll, hey, it's not, the, the, we're not given priority uh, or we're not given um, equal consideration. Uh, so let's have our own state. And, and now even within West Pakistan, now, or now Pakistan, um, there's now arguments for more nationalism problems between um, Punjabis and Balochis. The Balochis say, oh, the Punjabis have more preeminence. The state represents them more than it represents us. And, and within India, there's loads. There's, there's also Tamil independence groups in the South. They say that the state represents North Indians, not Tamils. Uh, we're the indigenous population. These, are, these North Indians are Aryan foreigners. Right, that, that I saw that was a clip on uh, online where a Tamil MP accused Modi of like to to stop uh, getting involved. Well, I suppose attacking him for his critique of of him and presume as, as a Tamil MP perhaps. And he basically said that you're you're an Aryan invader. Your people, your ancestors were actually foreigners who came into India, uh, who were Aryans. Right, we the Tamils were the indigenous people. So that was the argument. So nationalism never hasn't brought peace to the world. It only works in a society where everyone is the same ethnic group, the same language. But very few countries are. And so what you get is even in Western countries where let's say, uh, let's say in France, you say everyone's all French initially, but when you had immigration, uh, then now you have a minority or a perceived minority. And then you had what's called racism begin against these minorities, okay? And, and of course, even in countries where you think they're all the same ethnic group, which they're not, um, in Spain, for example, uh, Andalusia, the south, they had an independence movement, wasn't that popular. The Catalans, they speak, they speak Catalonian, of course. Um, they speak Catalan, sorry, but the Catalonians, uh, they were having an independence movement. It was a bit, it was violently suppressed. Uh, you have the Basques, they have, they have a, a unique language, um, which is before Indo-European, it was more, it was before the Indo-European languages. Um, they want an independence movement, it got violent even, they were suppressed. So even in European countries, you have tensions, political problems, racism, because of the nation state concept, the idea that the state represents the nation, but which nation? If there's multiple nations, which nation? So, so they try to, what they try to do, they try to make a new idea of nation. They say, well, okay, we're all Indians now. We're all Pakistanis now. We're not Punjabis, Balochis, Bengalis, uh, or um, pa uh, Pashtun. We are Pakistanis. Right? Of course, you say, well, actually, we're not, uh, and what have you. But what's the diff? What's to stop 
um, people in Bengal from saying, well, if you're all Bengalis and that defines you, then why don't you join with us? Because we're Bengali too. You say, well, well you're, you're, but you're a different culture to us. What? And they'll say, uh, why? Oh, because you're, you're like Hindu and we are basically Muslim. You say, well, but you've got Hindu citizens in Bangladesh who are meant, meant to be equal citizens, right? So then where's, what's the difference? If we're all equal, you could be Hindu, Muslim, what's the difference? So uh, the idea of na nation state is arbitrary. It's, it's fictitious, it's made up. Sure, ethnic groups or language groups exist, but they change over time, uh, which is where you get these diverse languages in the first place. I mean, Sanskrit as a basis diverged into multiple languages, you know, Gujarati, Punjabi, Urdu, and uh, Bengali was quite, uh, I, I, was, what I thought was quite interesting. Um, although Tamil is, is separate, Tamil is not part of that language uh, group. Anyway, so nationalism is arbitrary. Um, and you see it being argued by Rousseau, uh, Jacques Rousseau, the French philosopher, about the general will of the, of the nation or the country. Um, and as you see, what happens is that when secularism comes in, it creates a vacuum in, in, in the society because there's a need for a new communal, something to unite us as people as a community. So if it's not the deen of Islam anymore, it will be a new religion. And this new religion will be what you call culture. And the culture will be a, a flag you worship. You'll have the high priests of the religion, which is politicians telling you what the nation should want, what the nation doesn't want, and you have to obey. The nation becomes the God, basically, in this concept. And you have to show gratitude to the nation for giving you all the things where you were growing up and raising you and, and educating you. So well, wait a second, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that you know saw me, me raised up, uh, gave me sustenance, uh, gave us, put the sustenance, sustenance on earth. Uh, my family helped me, you know, they didn't do it for the sake of Bangladesh, they did it, they did it for the sake of, because they're my family. Uh, they they, sell the, they sold their services or they sold goods and they got money and they use that money to invest in my future. So where is this nation that I have to be grateful for that consciously gave me what I have, right? It doesn't exist, but it's spoken of like a God, right? And na nationalism is a in essence, a religion, it functions as a religion. It has rituals, rites, iconography, which is flags, of course. Um, and also the same human misuse is bigotry, supremacy, and partisanship. People separate, people say, I'm more patriotic than you. And they denounce you for lack of patriotism, even if you're not actually non-patriotic, whatever that word means. Um, so, uh, and it's been condemned by many Western philosophers, of course, but not influential ones. Um, uh, that, that say that incest is a form of idolatry. Uh, if only the Muslims understood that. This is a Western, it's not a Muslim guy saying this, it's a form of idolatry. Um, he says that if you put your own nation above humanity or above the principles of truth and justice, you've made your nation into a God because only God is the highest principle. So if you say that your nation above humanity and good and bad, justice, truth, then you worship, your God is this nation, this nation God concept and not actually God himself, not the ruler of the entire universe and the creator of the entire universe. And if someone says, uh, well, but surely nationalism, um, I, I spoke to this skeptic who said that, well, nationalism um, is, is, you know, that's like a, that's material, it's related to material world, whereas God is meant to be above the material world. And I say, no, 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 show me where the nation is. I want to see physically where this nation is. It's not, well, here's a flag. No, that's a piece of cloth. Show me where the nation is. Well, there's a, there's a, a border fence. No, that's a fence. Where's this nation? Where does it exist? It only exists in your imagination. If everyone who pretends like it exists, then it exists, it act, or you act like it exists, but you could equally change it. You could equally render it not existent by simply reimagining the borders uh, or, or changing how you perceive it. And of course, in Islam, we know that asabiya, which is forming groups or uh, having, having loyalty to groups, other than the Ummah of the, the Rasulullah is condemned by the Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad uh, said that those who, to paraphrase, those who call for Asabiyah for this kind of groupism, those who fight for Asabiyah, those who die from Asabiyah, they are not part of us. They're not one of us. So anyone who calls for it, 
right? Anyone who fights for it, anyone who dies for us to be a full groupism, for forming into, uh, for being lord, lord to groups, a lord to human collectives, or uh, a, a sabiyah was actually referring to at the time tribes. Uh, so anyone who forms a, any loyal identity is not one of us. Why? Because we're all Bani Adam. And on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not care what identity you'll call yourself. It won't change whether you're saved or not. In fact, it might actually change it because if you ignored the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to follow an arbitrary concept, uh, then that has an effect on the hereafter. And uh, as the Prophet Muhammad uh, وسلم, intimated with his hadith. Um, so again, we see um, uh, Syria was created from, um, uh, it was actually, I, the idea was to create into a bunch of different states, uh, but because they didn't, to, didn't work, they gave, Lebanon obviously was left, but they added it all together. And now it's under the control of a secular uh, minority group. Um, a religion, it was actually a religious group, not an ethnic group. Um, called the Alawites uh, under Bashar Assad. Of course, you know what's happening in Syria there. Um, the same with obviously M Malay nationalism, M Malays and Indonesians, um, the majority of them speak the same language, follow the same religion, uh, but they are two separate countries. Why? Because they were two, controlled by two different colon uh, colonial powers, the Dutch here, the English there, and strangely, um, the Germans over there, which kind of corresponds to, um, oops, uh, why you, the, the borders that you have today, completely arbitrary. And likewise, uh, Somalia was, convert, was obviously colonized into three different parts, French, British, and Italian. And lo and behold, today, um, we have Somalia, and now this is now Somaliland, and this is now Djibouti, as you can see. It's now Djibouti. This is now Somaliland, which is not recognized internationally, but is separated. And Somalia, and they have, these two have the same religion, same language, not different, they're not a different ethnic group, but they are arbitrarily separated. Um, as kind of this Lawrence, so-called Lawrence of Arabia, the guy who was helping the Arab revolt against the Ottoman Caliphate, what he said, uh, the aim of the Europeans at the time was, uh, he was referring to a particular colonial agent of the British, Sharif Hussein, uh, and that Sharif Hussein wanted to maybe have a caliph, uh, was, was kind of having his Arab nationalism. So he wanted, the, the Ottoman Caliphate to no longer be controlled by Turks, but be controlled by Arabs. In Islam, it doesn't really matter if it's Arabs or Turks, uh, from, from many mainstream opinions, it doesn't really matter per se. If, and there was already a Caliphate, so you have to obey the Caliph, he's already, he's already instituted. He didn't care about that, he wanted an Arabic-speaking Caliph, an Arabic um, ethnic you know, kind of Caliph. And so he thought that the British would help him in that. That wasn't their plan. And this is how the British used used him. His story for saying aim is to establish is the establishment of a caliphate for himself and independence for people speaking Arabic from their present, present irritating subjection to people speaking Turkish. So he wanted an Arabic state uh, because he didn't like being controlled by people who spoke Turkish, which is a, a jahil idea um, as for a Muslim to have. It doesn't matter the language of those who are, are administrators over you as long as they're, they're uh, Muslim. Um, his aims are thus in definite opposition to the pan-Islamic party who are his strongest ob obstacle. His activity seems beneficial to us because it marches with our immediate aim to break up the Islamic bloc and defeat and disruption of the Ottoman Empire and because the states he would set up to succeed the Turks would be harmless to ourselves. Uh, and he also said that, um, well, he argued the Arabs are even less stable than the Turks if properly handled they would remain in a state of political mosaic, meaning separate factions, all, um, all fighting each other, incapable of cohesion, basically. If, if we can only arrange that his political change shall be a violent one, we will have abolished the threat of Islam by dividing it against itself in its very heart. So Lawrence Arabia, British agent, um, explaining what he was, what they were aiming, what Britain was aiming to do um, in the Middle East. Um, we also see Lord Cromer in Egypt, um, get, again, controlling the education system, uh, making some very kind of basic changes to the, the Egypt, the, the Egyptian population, uh, trying to create the same thing they did in India, make a new class of rulers, which will be uh, what he called Europeanized. And I will just really kind of leave you uh, with his quotes to kind of explain what he was doing. I mean, he was someone who was in charge of, uh, of affairs in, in Egypt, 
uh, for a good long period of time. You know, Egypt was always colonized for over at least 50, 60 years, it was a long, long period of time. And here's what, um, what the aims uh, for Egypt was. The new system in Egypt they were creating was not gonna be according to Islam. Here's what he said. It is absurd to suppose Europe will look on as a passive spectator whilst the retrograde government based on purely Mohammedan principles and oriental ideas is established in Egypt. The material interests at stake are too important. The new generation of Egyptians has to be persuaded or forced into imbibing the true spirit of Western civilization. Um, anything that needs to be forced isn't a true spirit. Um, he also, they also use women's rights as a, as a disguise for injecting um, European or what we call also Western you know, political philosophies into the minds of the Egyptians. He said the position of women in Egypt and Mohammedan countries generally is therefore a fatal obstacle to the attainment of that elevation of thought and character which should accompany the introduction of Western civilization. Now, just some context. In England, this guy was opposing women's right to vote. Right? In England, he was opposing women's right to vote. So women should not be given the vote at all. But what he saw in the Muslim world is that the resistance they might get from the men uh, is actually, it's kind of, you have to deal with that. But if you target women, you get less resistance. If you, if you start to offer women, let's say, opportunities for, uh, let's say, well, well, now they call it empowerment, but if you offer them opportunities uh, to basically be educated under Western systems and, and be made to, to, uh, to do work and what have you, um, pre under the pretext of liberating them, uh, then you can, they, can make, they can be the more effective uh, kind of duat. They can be the most effective advocates for the Western political philosophies that you're trying to in, in, inject. Now, I want to kind of add a special caveat here. Um, Lord Cromer, again, and this, this just shows you, um, he's a snapshot of the European mind in the 19th century. In England, he wouldn't allow, I mean, they wouldn't allow women to be doctors. They wouldn't allow them to be doctors. And in Egypt, women could be doctors, like medical professionals uh, under Islamic law, they could be. But because they saw that as, as, as not in line with their Victorian English ideals, they stopped women from actually being professionals in medicine. They stopped that. Uh, one could argue um, that they were doing so because they wanted Muslim women to not to get rid of their kind of practice, their cultural practice of uh, only be, being seen by women doctors. So that, that, like for many, for in medicine, you should be seen by any doctor. In this case, you should be okay to be seen by male doctors because that's how we do it in the West. So you should accept that too in this country. If, if a male doctor is, is, is just as good as a female doctor, you have no excuse. And so there's no good reason why you should have female doctors. And so he stopped women from being from uh, under Islam as they could being medical professionals. Uh, so he didn't care about, he wasn't a feminist, uh, you know, to care about women's rights for li under, under modern day liberalism. Um, he was a classical liberal, so an, an earlier version of liberal, liberalism. Um, and he, that, that, he, his tactics in the Muslim world was to kind of claim he was advancing rights for women, but only as an angle by which he could spread um, Western political philosophy amongst the Muslim, uh, Muslim kind of society, because he, he surmised that women were more vulnerable or susceptible for exploitation in, in this, right? They give you less resistance than what they were encountering from the men. That was the justification that these colonists used. Uh, he also said, now he referred to using, uh, uh, getting Muslims, uh, even scholars, uh, as uh, turning them to liberalism and making them into reformers. And so he said that these reformers are the natural allies of, European, of the European reformer uh, because Egyptians, uh, Egyptian patriots, uh, you, you, he, he quoted a Latin phrase, how good they have it, will find in the, in the advancement of the followers of Muhammad Abdul, the best hope that they may gradually carry out their program of creating a truly autonomous Egypt. So he wanted to separate Egypt from the Egypt from the Ottoman um, Caliphate uh, at the time, and so because Egypt Egypt was was nominally a, a province of Ottoman Caliphate, but it was under British occupation. 
And so he praised Mohammed Abdul as a, as a reformer, a liberal reformer. Uh, fun fact, I suppose, about Mohammed Abdul. Mohammed Abdul, uh, he didn't like some, some fellow Egyptians that were, uh, were in a way obstacles to his political vision. Um, and one of these, these individuals, he, uh, he discussed with a friend of his about assassinating a political official who he didn't like. So Mohammed Abdul, a liberal reformer, was also a, an attempted terrorist, <laughs> uh, which Lord Cromer talks about. Lord Cromer mentions that he tried to kill someone that he didn't like. This is a liberal reformer, which is often when I say that liberals, liberals are, can, are fine with violence when it suits them. They are fine. They've always been fine with violence when it suits them. But when it doesn't, or rather when other people obviously do violence, now obviously uh, we, don't, we, we don't advocate violence, we advocate Dawa calling to Islam, it's the only method to revive the Muslim world. But when they, they condemn other people's violence or pe of groups they disagree with, but it's only because they have an ideological disagreement. If, if they see the need to do violence, liberalism will, will advocate terrorism and many of its philosophers, and if you see my previous lectures, modern day philosophers talk about the deliberate targeting of civilians can be justified under political liberalism if necessary. They say openly, and no one says, what's this? What is this? This is terrorism. You're justifying terrorism. Because it's normal for them. It's just like, oh, you know, it's just our political philosophy. It's just being, you know, balanced, they say. But in Islam, we condemn uh, the targeting of civilians. You can't target non-combatants. It's Even if you, it's deemed to be uh, of, of, of benefiting your power, your goals, or whatever, you, you're not allowed to do it. But you can see my other lectures because I don't want to get sidetracked. But liberals have always justified violence and violence against civilians when necessary, i.e. when liberalism says it is required to achieve its goal. Um, he then explained what he meant by autonomy for Egypt. Right Now, he's, now he gives you a tafsir. Now he's giving you an explanation. Consider what is generally meant by Europeans when they talk of Egyptian self-government. If they meant that the Egyptians should be allowed to govern themselves according to their own rude lights, meaning their own ideas, the task of educating them in the art of self-government would not merely have been easy. There would have been no necessity that it should have been undertaken. They were ruling themselves before we came, basically. That's what he was saying. The indigenous art of self-government had already been acquired in 1882, which is just prior to their, um, their occupation, their military occupation uh, of Egypt. Uh, but we have known uh, with what results. Um, they're talking about a default on a loan because the British controlled shares in the Suez Canal and Egypt defaulted on the loan. And then e uh, Britain used that as a pretext to basically invade and control Egypt. Um, no European instruction would have been able to improve on its recognized canons. What Europeans mean when they talk of Egyptian self-government is that the Egyptians, far from being allowed to to follow the bent of their own unreformed propensities should only be permitted to govern themselves after the fashion in which Europeans think they ought to be governed. So, um, well, that's pretty self, self explanatory. Um, he also says, on, uh, like Thomas Macaulay, about creating a new governing elite for, the Egypt, for Egypt. Um, the truth is that in passing through the European educational mill, so this Egyptian Muslim who's going through the Western educational system established in, that, in Egypt, the young Egyptian Muslim use, loses his Islamism. Now, um, just in case you're wondering, is he referring to the, the term used today to mean a political Muslim? Uh, no, what you, most people don't realize is Islamism was actually one of the original words for just Islam. Um, back then, it, after Mohammedanism, because Muslims said, well, why are you calling us Mohammedanists? We're not like, we don't follow, we're not uh, worshipping Mohammed like you call, you know, Christians follow the Christ. Uh, we're Muslims uh, or we follow Islam. So then they said, okay, well, like, like Judaism and Hinduism, then you are Islamism, right? So you are Islamists, right? Like, like uh, these other religions have an ism in it. Uh, but then later on in the 20th century, they dropped the ism and then, then they brought it back again uh, to refer to Muslims who believe that Islam has something to say about man's, mankind's affairs in life, which is pretty much the traditional Muslim for, 14, for 1300 or 1400 years, um, the, the norm in Islam. 
And so in it, I, I would say that they brought back the original meaning of the word, which just means a Muslim. An Islamist is just basically a Muslim, but a Muslim that doesn't want to be secularized. Although I think we shouldn't use that term. It's a derogatory term. There's only Muslims. We don't have Islamists. We, we only have, as you're a Muslim, you already are submitting to um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and therefore you are under Islam. Anyway, the young Egyptian Muslim uh, lo loses his Islamism. But in as much as Egyptian society is in a state of flux, the natural result has been to produce a class of individuals, many of whom are at the same time de-Muslimized Muslims. And um, in, it, so it's meant to be invertebrate Europeans. It says, uh, this is a spell check as, as we ch has changed this to invertebrate Europeans. In dealing with the question of introducing European civilization to Egypt, it should never be forgotten that Islam cannot be reformed. It is to say, Reformed Islam is Islam no longer, something else. Therefore, to the disqualifications of his competitors, the Europeanized Egyptian naturally becomes, if not the only possible, at all events, the principal agent for administering the country, except in as far as it's administered by Europeans. So basically, once you Europeanize these Egyptians, they become de-Muslimized. This new class of elite rulers and leaders are de-Muslimized, they lose their Islam uh, in, in the, the educational process. And, but because of that, they become the main agents to become the administrators of the country um, when, with no one better than them to be the administrators except Europeans directly themselves. Um, and now here is where Lord Cromer does takfir. <laughs> Um, of these Muslims, uh, these Europeanized Muslims that he that, that their, their education system has created. He himself tells a tuck fear of them. It's, a, it's, it's quite fascinating. He himself realizes they're not Muslim anymore. He says that, um, or he makes the argument anyway. When he says he realizes, he comes, he, he argues that he comes to his realization that they're not Muslim anymore. Um, he says, nominally, the, Europe, the Europeanized Egyptian is in the majority of cases a Muslim. In reality, he is generally an agnostic. The gulf between him and the alim of Al-Azhar University is as great as between the alim and the European. Indeed, it may be doubt whether the gulf is not, in, is not in reality greater in the former than it is in the latter, for a thoughtful European will not only look with interest at the alim as a representative of his ancient faith, um, which contains much that is highly deserving of respect, he will, if the alim is a worthy specimen of his class, sympathize with him because he is religious, albeit his religion is not without Christ. The Europeanized Egyptian, on the other hand, will often look on the alim with all the pride of an intellectual parvenu. I'll explain that in a second. From the, from the pedestal of his empirical knowledge, he will regard the alim as a social derelict who has to be tolerated and even occasionally for political purposes to be utilized, but who need not be respected. So what he's saying is, this new class of, let's say, westernized Muslims, who he says are really just agnostics. He says that um, Europea uh, Europeans actually respect Muslim scholars more than these guys respect Muslim scholars. Because the European, they have, you know, they have great respect for their own Christian scholars in, the, in, in Europe, um, who are very educated and well, in, in their religion. And you know, because these people are still Christian at this point in time, they have that respect for them. And they say, okay, well, you, we don't follow your religion, but you alims, we respect you as a learned member of your religion. But the Europeanized Egyptian has less respect for these alims because he thinks this alim is like, you're an ignorant, right? You, you don't have the education I do, right? So you're an ignorant person. Um, you're, you have, you're just a relic of the past. Uh, and that's what an intellectual parvenu means, meaning that you have this arrogance because you both came from a very low origin, which is what um, Lord Cromer is saying, that all of these Muslims are, uneducated, are not educated in European philosophy or European you know, culture at the, at the beginning. But, all, but one of them was the Europeanized Egyptian. And now he has pride because although he came from the same backwardness, uh, according to Lord Cromer, but because he's been raised up, he thinks he's now something special and, this, and the people he left behind are now ignorant. So he's arrogant now. But he says that the alim has, still has a use, still has a use. And as he goes through in, in his book, he basically says the alims, they, they only have one use now and just one. 
which is basically to rubber stamp anything the government says. So the government says anything the, the alims will, the, the alims that the government can control will say, yes, this is halal. What they're doing is halal. What this is doing halal. You have to obey the government. You have to obey them. They are government. You have to obey them. You say, well, uh, from Islamic legal understanding, they're not your government because the government has to rule. It's only legitimate if it rules with the Quran and Sunnah. It's the basis of why you have government in the first place is ruling with the Quran and Sunnah. So if they're not ruled by it, not only are they not your government, but also you can only have one imam, uh, which is the caliph, uh, which is the only government system Muslims have ever had for 1300 years. Even the Sultanate of Delhi and the Sultanate of um, uh, Daha or Bengal, uh, uh, they gave bayah to the Ottoman, to the, uh, well, at that time would be the Abbasid Calif Caliphate. So they've always recognized there was one Imam of the Muslims. But anyway, this is, I hope you probably see a few uh, pennies dropping in this when you see it. Um, as I say, light bulb switching on. Um, he then says, although the Europeanized Egyptian is no true Muslim, he is often as intolerant and sometimes even more intolerant of Christianity than the old Orthodox Muslim. Um, so what he's saying is that uh, this, what's strange is it, even in a new secular country, you get intolerance happening. So that even though this Europeanized Egyptian is no longer basically a, a, a true Muslim, they still hate minorities, uh, uh, even though Muslims are not meant to hate minorities. But he argued that basically they hate minorities even if their religion doesn't, is not important to them, they still hate religious minorities. Um, and in this case, he argues it's because he's, they're jealous of these Christians. Uh, in this case, I mean, Egypt, because these Christian Arabs who lived amongst Muslims for centuries, uh, they already follow the religion of the colonializer, but these, you know, and they feel jealous in a way, but they don't want to be Christian. Um, <coughs> um, but also, they also feel jealous of the Europeans over time because they want to take the, like, well, I, I've now learned what you've told me, Father. I want to take control now, right? And that's where you have nationalism arise. And that's where you have um, that even amongst secularists and secular liberals, now they hate, they, they hate colonialism, right? They say, I hate colonialism. That's why. They, they gave you your deen. You are continuing their deen. You are completing it, in fact. You're finishing it up. You're like their children in a way, they're ideological children. They're your fathers or your parents in a way, ideologically. You're finishing what they started. Why do you hate them? Well, I hate how people tell other people what to do, but, they, but these colon, European colonists, they said that you weren't, gonna be, you weren't gonna be following European ideas or Western ideas until they, they came to your country. So they had to come to teach you and force you because you weren't gonna take it anyway. Right. Oh, but I, we wish we could have been maybe, you know, persuaded or what have you say. Well, but you were. That's why they said they're going to come to your country and force you because your ancestors were not going to accept it otherwise. So really, you just hate how you became their children, but you are still their children and you're finishing their legacy. You are completing it, in fact. Um, he also says that Islam will be reformed until it disappears. So he says it will be conceivable that as time goes by, Muslims will develop a religion, possibly a pure deism, which will not be altogether the Islamism of the past and of the present, and will cast aside much of the teaching of Muhammad, but, will, but which will establish a moral code sufficient to hold society together by bonds other than unalloyed self-interest. So he says that what well, bonds the Muslim society now under their secular regime is just self-interest, but they hope that they'll develop a new, let's say, deen, which we base on principles, uh, other than re their religion, uh, which uh, under maybe a, a allowed a secular kind of religion that will bond their society uh, different from their religion that they followed before. The Europeanized Egyptian, as we now see him, is the first, not the last word of reformed Muslim society. It is possible that in the course of time, some higher moral and intellectual ideal will be developed. Um, and he also says, that, um, and his argument about, about backwardness, he talks about that the backwardness in the Egypt is not because of Muslims. He says that both the Christians and the, the Muslim Egyptians are both backward. The society is generally backward. It's not related to their religion. It's just their society has become, um, become backward. And he also talks about that some of the bad practices of the Muslims actually come from the contact from Europeans, uh, such as being cruelty to animals. 
And you see is that courted animals, um, they probably learned it from the Christian nations in South Europe, whereas the Muslim religion enjoins kindness to animals. So they must have picked up this bad habit from Europeans due to European influence. And there's many things that Muslims picked up from European influence, um, which affected our law system. Um, and then later on, these human rights activists will, will blame it on Islam. For example, in many, in some Muslim countries, there was a law that allowed a rapist to get away with rape if he marries his victim, which would lead people to pressure the, the victim to marry the rapist. Uh, this law doesn't come from the, the, the Sharia of Islam. The, this law actually comes from the Napoleonic law code. The, the, the law code of that liberal dictator, the poem was actually a liberal dictator, um, who that was part of the French penal code, which Muslims were adopting. Muslims were adopting or it was being applied upon them as the, a better, more enlightened law system. In Islam, we punish the rapist, just punish the rapist with, with lashes and, and at minimum, right? But um, in, uh, and that's a minimum, right? It's usually execution for Hiraba, you know, it's, it's quite, what would often be, be used against uh, um, Hiraba, meaning like highwayman or brigandage, which is what rape is in, in essence, part of that category. Um, but you see that Muslims were being were having these European laws, and then a hundred years later, these secular liberals were saying, "Look at how backward these Muslim laws are." But these laws came from Europe, right? Even they blame, "Oh, look at the Pakistani blasphemy law." The blasphemy law—they had issues with the blasphemy law in, in Pakistan, but that blasphemy law comes from England. It was actually um, it was actually drafted by a British colonial official, and it's shared in India has blasphemy law. It's the same. And, and ironically, the first person ever prosecuted in British controlled India under blasphemy law was two Muslims because they killed a cow. And the, in, the Hindus argued it was blasphemy against their gods because the cows are a sacred object. So ironically, Muslims were the, the victims of blasphemy law um, in, in India. Of course, Islam has a law that deals with protection of, of respect for the, 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 the prophetic personalities and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they should not be publicly vilified and insulted. You can debate, you can discuss, you can, as a Christian or someone who is an atheist, you can say, you don't believe in them, uh, you don't believe they're true and have a debate. That's, that's fine, that's not blasphemy. But to argue um, that the current blasphemy law, uh, law in Pakistan and in India, by the way, it is the product of Islam, which is ridiculous because why is it in India then, uh, is, is ignoring history. So, I think that's it. That was where I'm going to leave it. Um, but basically, I hope a lot of this explains the context that you live in, um, the things that you're, you're seeing in your society, uh, from your governments, uh, from the activists, uh, from the NGOs which support these um, human rights groups. These human rights groups tend to be very silent when it comes to Muslims being persecuted because of advocating Islam, advocating for um, the Islamic Sharia in your country um, for the, re the return of Islamic law, basically, not the, uh, not the uh, bringing something new. Um, how the liberals don't seem to protest so much about those things. They protest when liberals themselves are being arrested uh, because they've offended the, the, the secular ruling regime. But how you have, I, I call it first wave colonialism, a second wave colonialism, which is the, the secular ruling regimes in most Muslim countries, they're the first wave colonial uh, of colonialism, they're still implementing secular tyranny uh, to digest the society and wait for them to be ready for um, phase two. But they're not ready yet because they still hold on to Islam and they still want to bring it back as a way of life. But when they are ready, these uh, human rights uh, advocates are, are, are themselves raring to go to implement a, a secular liberal system uh, like you have in the, in the West. But if you, but if you think but that will bring tolerance to Islam, uh, think again, because as you know from France and from how they apply laws in England, Muslims have been arrested for, uh, for their speech. If they're not advocating violence, but they've been arrested for what they say, for what they wear, um, for, uh, for, for, for even what they protest. They get arrested and sentenced. Uh, and, and in England, to be fair, there are Christians uh, who are actually also arrested. Like there was a Christian guy who was arrested and fined for saying that homosexuality is a sin. He said it in public and he, he was, it was said that he was harassing and hate speech and he was arrested and fined for that. So uh, you don't really get free speech. What you get is um, you get in the West uh, freedom to be liberal. 
but not freedom to express any disagreement you want or any uh, any opinion you want. Uh, so, uh, you know, America is a bit different uh, because they follow a more older version of liberalism, but liberalism becomes more intolerant over time. Once it becomes more accepted, uh, you'll, it will start to be more intolerant. Um, but you, you might even see liberals in your country demand banning Muslim practices, um, which are part of Islam. Uh, you might already see that, although maybe they might argue, no, no, it's not, I don't hate Islam because obviously they can't say it out in public, but they'll say it's just as practice is all backwards. So anyway, I hope that's given you a lot of food for thought. I hope it's explained a lot of your current kind of context.